I was thinking about what Roger said in the very beginning about software and computers and technology taking over the world. Actually, people are taking over the world. With all this technology, the people part of business is actually even more complicated and harder than ever. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, as Tim mentioned, uh, my background is in technology a long time ago, and then I became inadvertently a researcher on training and HR and leadership and organizations. And so I'm kind of seeing how it all comes together. And what I want to talk about for a little while is this very strange disruption going on in the people side of business driven by the technology. And it is like a typhoon because everything's happening at the same time. Jessica mentioned how much money is going into technology. Do you know the average company has 22 human capital systems? All of your IT departments are about to buy new versions of Microsoft and Google, and there's dozens and dozens of Slack and other tools like that, and your employees are trying to figure out how to deal with all that. And while that's going on, the digital uh, uh, revolution or whatever we call it, transformation, isn't really about technology. We thought it was, because every, but everybody can kind of do the same technology. It's really how you manage the people behind digital, because what I found in the work I did at Deloitte all those years that I was you know, in the consulting business is that the problems you run into once you decide what your digital strategy is, is how do you organize yourself, how do you build agility in the teams, how do you build a service-centric organization, how do you iterate, how do you experiment, uh, how do you touch customers all the time and get data about them? Those are kind of people problems. They're not really technology problems. And the interesting thing is the whole economy is um, showing this. The, the United States economy now is 80 to 90 percent services. Um, so uh, the people part of your business are the product, and that's why I think this is so interesting. The other reason it's interesting is at this particular point in time, and every day I read another article on this, and just today there was another one, the job market gets tighter and tighter and tighter. Um, I was in Eastern Europe uh, the last couple of months in a couple of different cities, and I went to some countries where the unemployment rate is 1%. And basically what the employers told me is that they cannot hire anyone. It's impossible to hire people. The only way to hire people is to steal them away from someone else. And when they do that, they have to pay them more, and they're afraid to do that because then the prices are going to go up the next time they want to hire someone. So this is a really, you know, sort of tricky time. And what it really comes down to is building a value proposition and what we used to call employee engagement um, so people want to work in your company and that they will come to your company and they want to stay and they want to develop and grow. Now, one of the things that's also going on in this particular economic cycle, I just got this data actually, I looked at this over the weekend. You know, all these positive indications of the stock market and the unemployment rate, the wages are going up a little bit, but then this one I thought really pointed out what I think is really going on. Even though we have all these jobs and all this automation creating new roles and new opportunities, there's a very significant number of people who need to reskill themselves in a significant way. And um, you know, there's been studies done by the World Economic Forum uh, and a company called Burning Glass, and they went and they looked at all these future jobs that are being created by AI, and they mapped the counterpart uh, prior roles, and they found that on average, most of those people can be reskilled and retrained in about 18 to 24 months. It isn't a 10-year problem. But companies haven't figured out how to do that yet. And so uh, tools like O'Reilly Learning uh, that you heard from Roger and uh, so solutions like that to help fill these gaps are absolutely number one issues. We're going to announce some research with Deloitte next spring that's going to show you how acute this problem is. But learning is a huge, huge issue. The other issue in organizations is productivity. And I don't know where you all work. Even if you work in a small company, I'm sure you sense this that over this economic cycle since the 2008 recession, productivity growth has not been exceptional. And if you look at Russia, Japan, uh, Germany, 
Uh, most of the you know, developed economies, it's even slower than the United States. And so for myself, as somebody who's been a business person a long time and you know, managed a company, this to me is the other sort of underlying issue. How do we actually create productivity at the same time we're creating growth and employment brand? And the real issue in productivity is, you know, it's complicated. And one of the ways to think about productivity is if you go back in time, and Tim probably wrote about this in his book, Every time there's an industrial revolution, uh, and this is supposedly the fourth, uh, you know, there have been others. There was the steam engine, there was electricity, there were the beginning of the first mainframe computers. There's a five to ten year lag in productivity after the, right after the um, digital or technology revolution. And the reason for that, if you read some of the historians, is that the managers running companies at the time of the digital tr or the uh, technology transformation don't know how to use it yet. And so they try to apply the technology to the old way of working. And the example that I read, uh, you know, in, in uh, James Lesser's book was, you know, when they uh, electrified factories, they tried to use the same, you know, manufacturing process and run them faster, and all the machines broke, and they didn't have the skills to repair the machines, so actually they were less productive than they were with the steam engines, the steam motors that they had before, because they didn't understand the ideas of real-time manufacturing and supply chain management and analytics. They didn't have any of those concepts. So we're kind of waiting for this new generation of leaders, many of whom I'm sure are in this room, to re think the way we get things done so that we actually can jump up the productivity curve again. In the area of HR, um, this is all measured through engagement. Engagement, I mean the HR version of engagement, not the you know, sort of app version of engagement. Um, if you look at employee engagement data, it has not gone up really at all in the last 10 years. This is data I've been looking at from uh, Glassdoor for about a decade. And if you look at the average, it's pretty much of a bell curve, actually, it's interesting. Um, the average uh, of this data at around 2008, during the depths of the recession, was 3.11. So it's only gone up by a couple of percent in 10 years. And if you live in my world, in the HR world, you've seen nothing but engagement books, engagement courses, engagement consultants, engagement tools, uh, engagement models, and none of them seem to be really working very well. And the reason for that is that the problem is actually very complicated. Um, it's really hard to build an organization that is a great place to work for everybody, especially when we have five or six generations in the workforce, uh, people with different expectations <clears throat> based on their role. And if you look at the data on engagement and you look at the companies that are on the right side of this curve, and I've done this, <coughs> excuse me, um, there is no pattern. They are not tech companies. I'll talk about Google in a minute and what happened last week. Uh, they are not young companies. They are not small companies. They are not companies in California. The only thing that's unique about those companies is their leadership, their focus, their understanding, their belief that the people are the product. And let me give you an, one story on that that I think is really sort of uh, something to remember. I was at the Workday user conference a year ago. Workday, as you all know, is a very successful company, um, you know, very fast-growing company. They're really sort of, um, really hurting a lot of the incumbents in the HR technology space. There were 7,000 customers at the user conference a year ago. Uh, Dave Duffield stood up in front of all 7,000 customers, and the first thing he said was, welcome, you are not my number one concern. You are my number two concern. My number one priority is my employees, and I am taking care of them first so that they can take care of you. And then, of course, this is all HR people. There's a huge round of applause, and everybody, you know, just love that. But that's actually a very profound statement that a lot of companies don't understand uh, that is absolutely proving to be true in this particular economy. Now, one of the reasons that this, is, this whole re-engineering and, you know, world of work is changing so much is this. And I'm going to do some work with O'Reilly and write some things with O'Reilly on this, but I've done a lot of work on this already. Um, we don't operate like hierarchies anymore. And even though you, you probably manage your company like a hierarchy and your job titles and your job levels and your pay and your leadership models and all sorts of things are based on that, people work in small groups, they iterate on small teams, they're cross, in cross-functional organizations. If you're trying to do a digital transformation, 
Believe me, I know you're talking about teams and team management and agile and how do we build teams and how do we form them and how do we decompose them and how do we measure a team. We just finished a piece of research last week on performance management and found that one of the characteristics of high impact performance management is measuring people based on the performance of their team, not them as an individual. And in fact, if you think about your career, most of my career, all of my performance appraisals were based on what I did, not on what I contributed to a team or what my uh, role was on a team or my followership on the team. Those are becoming essential changes to the world of work. And your HR people are going through a lot of rethinking about everything they've done on how they manage and train and support and hire people around that. The other issue that's really become significant in business is trust. Um, I don't need to go through this with people who live out here in California. You're probably all of the same vein that I am. But this is Edelman Global Research. I don't know how many people took this survey. It was tens to hundreds of thousands of people. All over the world, people have lost trust in their political institutions. And so they actually believe that their corporate um, employers are more trusted and they are throwing their weight and their um, expectations on their CEOs. And so CEOs are being asked to step up and take positions on social issues, deal with issues like diversity and inclusion in a forthright way. Um, and, and this is what we observed last week at Google. And this is a new role for, for business people. I mean, if you went to business school when I did, nobody talked about this. This was not something CEOs touched. Now it's basically unavoidable. In fact, I just read some research recently that 60% of consumers will not buy products from companies whose CEOs do not take positions that they feel comfortable with. So if the CEO is not somehow involved in the issues that are relevant to their company and their industry, and making some public statement about that, consumers feel less comfortable doing business with that company. And it's even true out here. I mean, I've lived in the Bay Area most of my adult life, and um, you know, I don't know how you guys feel. A lot of you guys probably work for tech companies. Tech companies are not considered to be the best companies to work for or the most responsible or the most um, positive organizations in our climate, particularly here in the Bay Area. And so um, it's touched every single industry. I've been working with banking and pharmaceuticals and insurance companies and all these other companies for a long time. They've had decades to figure this out. I don't think the tech companies have yet. I think the tech companies are just beginning to realize how important responsibility is. And this is the perfect example. I mean, I was just astounded looking at the videos and the, the photos last week of what happened at Google, and it's an indication of the fact that employees are rising up, they are taking ownership for their roles in business, their expectations are higher than ever, and they don't feel um, that they are necessarily dependent on you as an employer anymore. They're not because right now they can find another job relatively easy, if, certainly if they're in their big city, not if they're in a small city. And so our ability to build a sense of trust and transparency with people is now a critical strategy in business performance, not just HR. Now, you know, let me talk a little bit about um, some of the dimensions of that, and then I'll wrap up with a little bit about technology. One of the reasons that I think this is interesting and this is, you know, I'm in my early 60s, so I've kind of lived through, you know, some of these eras, is that we really have, in many ways, we're in the middle of trying to figure out what is the leadership model of today. I don't think we're quite there yet. Is it um, the Microsoft growth mindset? Most of you, if you know anything about how Microsoft's transformed itself, the biggest transformation at Microsoft is going from a company that told people how smart they were to a company that actually learns. And that's totally transformed Microsoft's culture in every possible way. Um, this has been taking place, if you, if, you know, we're right here in, you know, near Genentech, which is a company focused on health and wellness. Um, I met with a bank in Canada, the one, of the, one of the most uh, highly engaged com uh, financial services companies in Canada, and I asked the HR leaders, what do you guys do that makes you such a great place to work as a bank? And she said, we're not a bank. We're actually here to promote the health and wellness of our communities. We just happen to sell mortgages and have checking accounts as the way we do that, but that's not our mission. So this is a new way of thinking about organizations that is starting to catch fire 
And I think even companies like Google and Facebook and Twitter and tech companies are beginning to realize that this is really what's going to um, change, you know, the way we manage our people is really rethinking about the value proposition of the business that we're in. Now, one of the things that's also become very big in the area of, of, of work, the world of work, is well-being. And the funny thing about well-being is, on the one hand, if you look at um, health, the world is getting very healthy. We're living a lot longer. Every year, a baby born on a given day is, like, is expected to live six to nine months longer than a baby born that day a year earlier. So, we're, so our longevity is going up at a very, very fast rate. In fact, people think it's going to actually exponentially go up. So, um, so my children are very likely to live into their hundreds. Apparently, I have a 50% odd of odds of living into my 90s, according to some data I got from Deloitte. Um, but, given, but yet, at the same time, people are working longer hours. 40% uh, of Americans work 50 hours or more. In the United States, we're actually taking... As, a, as an entire population, we're taking a week less vacation now than we did in 1998, which is just a, sort of an astounding finding. And so employees are going to work and they're saying, I want yoga classes, I want better food, I want a better desk, I want better light, I want to work from home. And they're asking for a lot. And what that's doing is really changing the way we think about the work experience and the work environment. And for those of you that might be close to your HR peers or your HR organizations, they're going through a big rethinking of what they offer at work. In fact, in most companies now, the HR department and the facilities department are now in the same department because so much of what happens at work is about, and I notice there's a nice gym right here, is you know, my ability to stay fit and healthy and financially healthy too. I mean, one of the things that's happening in the world of HR is the idea of financial fitness is also an enabler for work. There's some really an, sort of astounding data on the lack of financial fitness in the United States. I think the um, average retiring American has $3,000 in the bank or something like that. It's just a terrible number. Um, and so all of this is part of your work experience too of this new world of work. Um, I also think embracing Older people is part of the new world of work. Um, I'm particularly sensitive to this because I was forced to retire from Deloitte this year, and I'm not retiring, and I realize how much age discrimination we have on the high end of the workforce. It turns out, if you, because the workforce is so, the labor market is so tight and the birth rate in the United States is below replacement, we actually need older people to come back to work. I met with the head of talent at GM a couple weeks ago. They actually are now going to all of their retirees and they're offering them bonuses to come back to work, to work part-time, to take some of their old jobs. And that is affecting the new world of work. And then, of course, there's the issue of management. And I won't spend a lot of time on this chart, but this is a fascinating model that we developed when I was at Deloitte that looks at what leaders do in these high-performing, digital, agile, customer-centric organizations. And they do different things. They behave differently. Uh, they have different skills. They're oftentimes much, much younger. So this is part of the new world of work, too. All of these things are coming together. Let me wrap up with one more thing, talk a little bit about technology. All of this is going on at the same time. You think technology is exciting for social media and publishing and all that stuff. Look at the technology in HR. I have 1,400 vendors in HR technology that I'm tracking. It is an astounding market. And so the other thing that's going on in the world of work is a massive focus on trying to build more productive, useful tools in your companies to make it easier to get our work done. So it's a lot of change going on in the world of work, and, and I'm actually really excited to be working with O'Reilly now, and I'm going to do a lot more with O'Reilly over the next year to try to give you some more information on how you can think about the people side of your organization while you think about the technology side of your organization at the same time. Thank you very much.